yesterday. Um, we just finished chapter 26 of the arena. We just finished a beautiful section on prayer and on the Jesus prayer in particular. And um, I have a hard time leaving this subject because it's such a beautiful subject. It, because the Jesus, the, the Jesus prayer is so powerful and it's really saved the minds and the souls and the lives of so many people. Just a simple prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So I'd like to read a little bit more by Bishop Ignatius on the Jesus Prayer. This is his entire book on the Jesus Prayer. So we've been covering a few chapters in the arena on the Jesus Prayer, but actually the bishop wrote an entire book on the Jesus Prayer. And I'd like to read um, the safe way for beginners to start the Jesus Prayer. We've, he'll reiterate here some things we've already heard in the arena, but it really bears repeating. Repetition is the mother of studies. And I, I think um, that some of these things really bear repeating, and I want to repeat them for the sake of emphasis. We consider it, I'm going to read it some length here. We consider it our duty to elucidate here, as far as our poor understanding and poor experience will allow, the teaching of the Holy Fathers on the artistic cultivation of the prayer of Jesus. We shall explain clearly how the prayer is to be practiced and what form of the prayer is suitable for all beginners without exception, whether monks or laymen, and what form of it is proper for proficients who have been raised to proficiency by God's will and God's grace. Undoubtedly, among all the ways, the first place must be given to the way proposed by St. John of the Ladder, since it is particularly easy, absolutely safe, necessary, and even indispensable if prayer is to be effectual, and it is suitable for all Christians living piously and seeking salvation, both monks and non-monks. The great director of monks, that is St. John of the Ladder, twice speaks about this method in his ladder, which leads from earth to heaven, in his word on obedience, in his word on prayer. The very fact that he expounds his method in the exposition of his teaching on obedience for monks living in community shows clearly that he, this method is intended even for novices. So again, the bishop is referring to this question of whether only monks are supposed to say the Jesus prayer, or whether Christians at all spiritual levels and all ways of life are supposed to say the Jesus prayer. And he's a strong advocate of everyone saying the Jesus prayer. This method is described again at length in a separate teaching on prayer after the instruction for hesychasts. Consequently, it is repeated for proficient monks. This shows clearly that the method is very good also for hesychasts and proficient monks. We repeat, the greatest advantage of this method consists in the fact that besides being thoroughly satisfactory, it is absolutely safe. He's talking about the safety of the prayer because it is true that people who are not properly instructed try to acquire constant prayer and they, they make themselves sick. They, they can't do it. If, if someone who doesn't have a proper instruction and isn't leading a proper moral and sacramental life in the church tries to pray constantly, and, uh, our says, and then, uh, then he gets into trouble. Uh, we even have examples of people outside the church. I've met, I remember being in a grocery store one time, and this Hindu walked up to me and asked about the Philokalia and the Jesus prayer. And I said, well, you know, you have to be Orthodox. You need to be in the church, because it's not just a technique or a method. It's a, a way of communicating with, with Christ, our divine saving. You have to believe in Christ. You know, well, he didn't like that very much. He just thought it was just one more spiritual method among others. So uh, there are people who uh, harm themselves by saying the Jesus prayer improperly, but the bishop here is teaching us a completely safe way to do it. And he's using St. John the Ladder. So St. John the Ladder says, try to restore, or more exactly to enclose your thought in the words of the prayer. And this is the key element of correct prayer. When we're praying, we don't try to arouse emotions, and we don't allow our mind to take the words of the prayer and run with it and imagine things. But we do this very simple, although very difficult thing, which is to simply pay attention to the words themselves, just say the words. And the words themselves teach the mind what they mean. The words themselves have, have divine power. If on account of its infancy, the infancy of the prayer, it wearies and wanders, lead it in again. Or it's as, many, as many times as the mind wanders, bring it back. When it wanders, bring it back. If you're saying a uh, in a prayer rope, and you're saying the Jesus prayer 33 times, 
probably for every, out of 33 times, at least 10 times your mind's going to wander. And every time, you force your mind back to the words of the prayer. And this action of constantly forcing your mind back is actually the mechanism that attracts divine grace. And it makes us strong in, in our desire to pray and in our love for prayer and in the power of prayer. It's like exercising. It hurts. But the more you do it, the stronger you get. And, uh, it, and it doesn't matter. And if it hurts, that's all right. That's part of it. Well, it's like in prayer. Our mind wanders and it's difficult and it's boring and it's painful. That's, that's good. No pain, no gain. So you, you force yourself back to paying attention to the prayer. The mind is naturally unstable, but he who orders all things can control it. And this is another very important thing. The human mind is naturally unstable. And that's a principle I've talked about many times before. So human beings, alone of God's creatures, human beings have minds that change. See, the animal, animal's mind is governed by instinct. It's very predictable. Animals don't make choices. They just follow instinct. And their behavior is remarkably consistent. It's basically always consistent, depending on the stimuli that they're given. Angels, the other rational creatures besides human beings, are angels. But the, the mind of the, the angels is completely pure, and the will of the angels is fixed in one direction. Their mind doesn't change. So at some moment before the creation of the visible universe, all of the invisible intellects, the angels, made a choice, either for or against God. And from that point on, their minds were fixed in that direction because of the, this, the, uh, the incorporeality of their existence. They don't have a, an unstable element. They're just pure mind. And they're just going in that direction now for all eternity. The, angel, the good angels toward God and toward greater and greater holiness and love for God and the demons for greater and greater distance away from God. Their minds are set. But human beings are part angel and part animal. And, and our minds are subject to change. Our minds are unstable. They, they go up and down. They go backwards and forwards. They go left and right. And this is what make, one of the things that makes human beings unique. And it's one of the key characteristics to understand about our nature as long as we're in this life. And once the soul leaves the body, then the soul is set in the direction it's going to go. And remember the image I've used before is like when a spaceship leaves the Earth's atmosphere, and then by inertia it just keeps going in that direction. So they're so careful to point it in the right direction. Because if, if nothing else stops it, it's just going to go by inertia in that same direction indefinitely. And the soul is like that. That's why it's so important to purify the soul in this life. And to be ready, we're, we're constantly in, in the church talking about preparation for death and for a good death because we want the soul to be purified and to be going towards God in that direction when the soul dies. So after death, the mind acquires stability, going one direction or the other. But in this life, as long as we're in the body and in this world of change, of constant instability and change, our minds are very changeable. But one of the, the, the qualities of a, a righteous person and of a saint is that their mind becomes more and more stable and the mind goes more and more in the right direction it's more and more cleaves to the thought of God but when we're beginning a life of prayer this is very difficult and uh, very often for not pious people not irreligious or, or uh, especially sinful people but pious people who love the church and who love orthodoxy and are very religious they'll come to confession and they always say that they're very sorry that they don't pay attention when they pray. They don't pay attention when they pray. And the consoling thing is that the saints have noted this as well. And, and many, of the, many of the saints have talked about how they struggle to pray. And one of the fathers said that prayer is warfare to the last breath. So we shouldn't be discouraged if we have a hard time praying because the saints all experience this. But as they went further in their life of prayer, their minds acquired more and more stability. So the vision. May I ask a question? Uh, the problem I have is I fall asleep Ah. I, when I pray. Well, one thing is to make sure you're standing up. <laughs> don't sit down. Don't be too comfortable. Yeah, don't be too comfortable. Stand up or kneel. 
and um, won't fall asleep. and then we and we make the sign of the cross frequently during prayer at every mention of the Holy Trinity, make the sign of the cross, and uh, make and in prayer books it'll talk it'll it'll when it mentions the, the name of the Holy Trinity we make the sign of the cross, and uh, also making vows. We you know, earlier in an earlier chapter of this book we discussed the practice of making matanias or vows, yes. which is a key part of Orthodox spiritual life. Well, the Jesus prayer. Uh, you repeat the Jesus prayer, and you say uh, the uh, uh, the Holy Trinity every how often? Well, there's no there's no um, there's no set practice of saying the the glory to the Holy Trinity during the prayer rope. Um, you you just say the the prayer of Jesus so many times, as many times as your rule is appointed, or as many times as you've decided to say it. There's no there's no given time when you say the doxology to the Holy Trinity. But you should be standing. Yes. And now there are, of course, if someone's already said their prayer rule standing, like someone's already been praying for a while standing, then they're tired. It's beneficial to then sit down and really concentrate on saying the Jesus prayer. So if you're not distracted by the movement of your body, you're just saying the Jesus prayer. But it's, it's not a good idea to start out by sitting down. You should stand up in front of our icons, light our lamp, light our divani, and um, read the rule in the prayer book it's for the night prayers. And then, once that is, once our mind is really, our mind and body is really prepared, then we can say the Jesus prayer more profitably. And then, then you can sit down and if you fall asleep then. So, yeah, okay. so you fall asleep saying the Jesus prayer, that's the best way to fall asleep. Oh, I've discussed this previously with people here. I said people should never, ever go to sleep with the TV on or the radio on. Because you know what kind of influences are coming into your unguarded mind at that point. And, um, you know, one time I was, I, I told uh, our participants here, one time I went to this young man's house, he wanted to be a deacon. And uh, he's very keen on the church and very into the church services. And I go there and I notice that the, I went there to see them relatively late at night for some reason, I don't recall the, the occasion. And the television was blasting and their children were all in their pajamas lying on the couch going to sleep with the television on. I said, what are you doing? So the, the child's mind is unguarded. That, that borderland between waking and sleep is the most suggestible right, period. Right. And all this garbage coming from the television, right. you're just, uh, it's even worse than usual. Yeah, the, the influence is even worse than normal. That's right. And I say always, so I think from then on, he, he got the message and said, children should go to sleep praying. So if your children are having a hard time praying, say, say the Jesus prayer. I enjoy listening to Psalms going to Oh, that's a nice thing. You have like a recording of the songs. I have uh, CDs and mm -hmm. uh, CDs. oh, like a Byzantine chant. And yes, great. Yeah, this is good. Byzantine chant is naturally sanctifying and therapeutic. If you, if people, I think, so. I think if we just, I think so. If we want to cure everybody, we just shut down all sources of noise in society and go around the whole city with sound trucks. The Byzantine chant 24 hours a day and pipe into everybody's house. I think in 24 hours, people would have a lot fewer neuroses and, and even physical illnesses. Because it's, it's, it, it, it's really a divinely inspired art form. The words of the hymns and then the, the music is just, it's just perfect. Some of the words are connected. You cannot find them in any language. And, uh, they were inspired by angels. Yes, it's angelic. Angelic, angelic words. Angelic words. Yeah. So never, never pray laying down, like if you're in bed. Oh, you certainly. Well, no, no, not never. We should, we should strive to pray all the time, all right. time, no matter what we're doing. But what I'm saying is that we shouldn't only pray lying down or sitting down. Which we should have a, we should have a set time and we stand up and say our <coughs> formal prayers. Like all the prayer books have set prayers for morning and evening prayers. Mm -hmm. And that's like a backbone or a foundation. It gives us a discipline. Okay. It's like, uh, you know, in figure skating, I don't know if you've ever watched figure skating. Yeah. I know it's because my wife and daughters are love figure skating. So, they, <laughs> yeah, watch figure. so but there's something interesting in figure skating, which is, you know, there are the compulsories, and then there's the freestyle skating. But it, it's because those, and it's amazing to watch these 14 year old young people who can do this incredible, these incredible leaps and jumps and, all thing. But since they were little bitty things, they were three or four years old, they were doing these compulsories, doing these figure eights, doing these circles, and so forth. Because the, the foundation of all spontaneity in life is repetition and discipline. 
So all, all spontaneity is really an illusion. The spontaneity comes when someone is so they're so practiced in something it's spontaneous. that then they can then it becomes really spontaneous instead of forced. And uh, so formal prayer and learning prayer from prayer books and from the, the Psalter is not opposed to personal or spontaneous prayer. It actually gives birth to genuine spontaneous prayer. Okay. So the, the thing is to stand up in front of the icons, open your prayer book, go through the usual prayers. Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us, and so forth. Be our Father, the Psalm 50, the customary evening or morning prayers. And, and then that way we have a, a structure, a backbone, a foundation, a formal training. And then as we grow in our love for, for the prayers that are from the Bible and that the fathers have written, then our hearts will spontaneously also start to pray. And, and we'll start spontaneously to pray in these words. I remember my children grew up, of course, the children of a priest. I was, a, I was ordained when my eldest child was six months old. So they, they grew up in the priest household, and they grew up hearing the Psalms. And it was very, it was funny, and it was heartwarming to hear my six or seven-year-olds suddenly use a phrase from the Psalms in their ordinary language, because they thought that was, they thought that was ordinary speech. But that's an example of how the psychology of the Bible and of the prayer books and of the service books actually affects us and becomes our own if we're immersed in it. It's a way of just transforming the mind and um, thinking in these scriptural and patristic terminology in the spiritual world, having your mind immersed in the spiritual things. Versus cartoons. Versus cartoons, yes. Or certainly versus things, obvious things like rap music or uh, violent sexual movies and things like that. So we're, we're into vampires now. Oh yes, have we're you noticed that? Yeah. yeah. Everything's a vampire. Yeah, everything's a vampire. Movies, yeah. in movies and TV is all vampires. Yeah, vampires. And uh, it's, it's the exaltation of the occult combined with uh, sexual undertones, or even not so undertone, overtly. And um, what's, what's interesting is that, well, and sobering, is, of course, vampires drink blood. And uh, we know from the teaching of the church that demons hunger for human blood. That sounds crude or primitive, but it's actually, food. it's true. Yeah. Food. It's the energy, of, the energy of human life. So it's demons who inspire wars where you kill millions of people and, and crimes where so many people are slaughtered because they hate human beings and, and, and they, they, they live off of human energy which is expressed or carried in the blood and the, this obsession with vampires is very very sick it's very very sick in the 50th Psalm there is a like, yeah, deliver me from blood guiltiness mm -hmm. is it that's this King David said that psalm after he sent Uriah the Hittite to his death. Remember the account of life of King David, mm -hmm. where he sent his, uh, his her husband. Her husband, yes. He he was uh, he wanted to, he was committing adultery with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, mm -hmm. and he 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 told he wanted to get rid of Uriah, so he basically he murdered him by telling the other officers to order the men to fall back when Uriah was in the front rank, mm -hmm. so he'd be killed. And he was so David had committed adultery and murder. Yeah, and he's asking God to deliver him from the blood guiltiness, blood from guiltiness for Uriah's blood, okay. for the death of Uriah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, getting back to Bishop Ignatius' words on the Jesus prayer, the mind is naturally unstable, but he who orders all things can control it. If you acquire this practice and constantly restrain it, he who sets bounds to the sea of your mind will say to it during your prayer, hitherto thou shalt come and shalt go no further. That's Job. Uh, God was talking to Job about his creation of the world and, and he was talking about how he had, God alone can tell the sea, hitherto you come and go no further. Well, he says that to our mind too. God, he's the Lord of all things. It is impossible to bind a spirit, but where the creator of that spirit is present, there everything obeys him. The beginning of prayer consists in banishing the thoughts that come to us at their very appearance. The middle is when the mind stays solely in the words, 
pronounced vocally or mentally. That's from St. John the Latter. So the beginning of prayer consists in banishing the thoughts that come to us. Now these thoughts, the Greek fathers have a word for these thoughts. The word in Greek is logismos. So it's a, it's a specific um, ecclesiastical or ascetical term for our wandering thoughts. It's all, all, all sin and ultimately all human uh, illness comes from uh, unhealthy or dark or evil or unclean thoughts. Who is born on the daughter of Babylon? Yes. Yes, that's, that's from the psalm. This is, Blessed is he that takes your children and dashes them against the rock. That's in the psalm. And the Father say those children are the thoughts that you dash against the rock and the rock is Christ. So um, sin starts with a thought. There's a, what the Greek fathers call the prosvoli, or the initial provocation. And then the mind plays with the thought, and then the mind consents to the thought, and then the will could, uh, consents to do the action suggested by the thought. So that sin is in several stages, and if we cut off the thought at the very beginning, then we don't sin. And there are, there are, and there are other thoughts that would perhaps don't lead to outward sins, but they're constantly making the mind sick. A thought of pessimistic thoughts, despairing thoughts, of lustful thoughts. Just in the Gospel today, we've read our Lord's words uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Even if you look at a woman to commit adultery, you've committed adultery. See? Which is a very high standard. Who can do this? Well, only in the Church, with the help of grace, a human being's mind can be transformed so that even these initial thoughts are cut off. And the thought is, so when people's thoughts are purified, their bodies may still become ill. Of course, we're all going to die. So the body still becomes ill because of the general frailty of mankind. But even illness then becomes something cheerful and something sanctifying because the mind and soul are essentially healthy. And often even physical healing takes place. I mean, how many times, even people outside the church, people just have a positive attitude are more likely to recover from cancer uh, and other diseases. And how much more, if we have the help of grace and that we're in the church, should a transformation of our thoughts really help us to overcome things? And we don't, we, we have all these tools at our, right at our fingertips, we don't use them. It's like orthodoxy is like the, the treasure chest and nobody opens it. And sometime, one time somebody came to me and said, you know, um, I'm really upset because these Protestants do all this missionary work and, and, and they really market their ideas and they, 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 they seem to do a lot with people. We don't seem to do very much. And I said, well, I said, you're right. I said, that doesn't mean that their teachings are true and the church's teachings are false. I said, it's like somebody who has, a, um, has some costume jewelry and he gets out and he really hawks it and sells it and he, and he, he gets out there and he, he values it and he wants to sell it. He wants to pass it around. I said, as opposed to somebody who has a whole treasure chest full of gold and silver and diamonds. He doesn't value it. It's, it's covered by dust. And it's, he, doesn't, he doesn't even remember where the, the key is for the lock. And that's like orthodoxy because we don't, we don't open up the treasure chest. But if we do and we use these tools that, that the church gives us, it's, it's something tremendous. How do you say, if you are Say, uh, no. If you are saying thousands of around you, would you say? That saint said a female sadhu. He said, acquire the spirit of peace, peace, and a thousand souls around you will be saved. Uh, this is a, a very profound thing because, you know, today people don't have peace. Life is in constant turmoil, mm -hmm. noise, confusion competing, 10,000 people competing for your attention with all their ideas or something they want to sell you or something they want to do to you. And um, if you actually could un unplug your mind from all of that and really cleanse your mind through prayer, confession, Holy Communion, constantly saying the Jesus Prayer and really grow spiritually, um, you do become a source of grace for other people, even ways you don't even understand. You don't even realize people you don't even know. There's people down the block. You influence them. 
Yeah, you know, they might even know you. If the influence may even be just without their even knowing it. And um, so that's it's very important. What orthodoxy preeminently has to offer is authentic spiritual life, which is what human beings are made for: to love God and to be in communication with God. And if if we acquire that, that's why I, in these talks I really like to emphasize prayer and I like to emphasize spiritual life. Because it's, we cannot, just by our own cleverness, our own efforts, we cannot possibly deal with the incredibly complex problems around us. It's just, it's beyond <laughs> any human being. And, and when, when, you, when you are, uh, when you are praying, and when you are in communion with God, uh, you cannot help but to help your help, uh, your fellow man. Uh, you, you will do something to uh, good uh, and positive yeah. for them. You'll, you'll yeah. make their uh, stumbling blocks into uh, stepping stones. You'll, yeah. you'll give them a hand and, and lift them up. Yeah, your heart grows in charity. Right. And you also then have the wisdom to know what to do for them. Because right. it, is, isn't, it isn't always obvious what they actually need. And you also, you also grow in wisdom knowing who you can help and who you can't. And what kind of help they really need. Which is very difficult. Yeah, it opens up, it, it opens up our spiritual eye, our spiritual understanding. Yeah, yeah we're all, yeah we know the theories. It's doing it. That's why that's why I like these concrete. I like these concrete directions about how to do these things. Oh, yeah. Bring bring the body, and the mind will follow. That's oh. that's what we do. We talk about. Um, as people say that about church, well, I don't need to go to church. My mind is in church. I'll say, like, right, <laughs> of course. Bring the body, the mind will follow. Bring the body, yeah. Bring your body to, at least bring your body to church. And uh, we talked about this in um, talking about the chapters in prayer. We talked about the importance of a proper attitude. You know, like when you were mentioning, should we stand up to prayer? Yes, we should, because the soul, the soul conforms to the attitude of the body. Because we're, we're not a, a soul trapped in a body. We're a body-soul organism. That we, modern people have to make this mistake. All modern thought, even though people don't realize it, they're influenced by Descartes, the philosopher Descartes, who said that man was a ghost in a machine. The body was the machine and the, the soul was the ghost. It's just a ghost trapped in a machine. Well, the body's not a machine. It's part of who we are. It's part of our humanity. And the soul is the life principle of the body and the soul and the body's energies interpenetrate each other so that's why i said earlier thoughts can make the body sick an evil thought dirty thought dark thoughts make the body sick and likewise evil actions of the body or just uh, illness involuntary illness of the body can make the soul suffer and make the soul sick and in prayer if the body's not rigid or not not attentive, and the soul and the mind won't be attentive, except for people who are very advanced in prayer and who just pray 24 hours a day. They pray all the time. I, I believe that thoughts are things. I think that they are something. It's not just a, a vapor. No, no, it's uh, something. A thought right. is something. Just like you said, you know, uh, uh, you sin by, by lusting. Well, a lust is a thought. That is something. It's not just uh, you know uh, a vapor. It's not just no. It's uh, it is it is something. Yes, it's a, it's a, it has spiritual reality. Yes. Um, one mistake that people make is they, they think the mind is just like a hard disk and you can just scrub it out now and then, but you can't. You can't. No. You can't. And uh, one image I like to use is that the mind is like an old-fashioned photographic negative or photographic film, and once that light hits that celluloid, it's there. It's very hard to, and, with the mind, it's very hard to get the stuff out. And I believe that when you pass on, that's what you show them. Yes. Your life and every thought that you've ever had. All those thoughts. That's, and that's why in spiritual life, for example, in monasteries, the monks confess their thoughts every day. And people say, people will come to confession, and uh, sometimes they've never been asked, or they're surprised when the priest says, well, do you have bad thoughts? Well, of course I have bad thoughts. I say, ah, but... Don't take it for granted. Confess them. You know, I've had angry thoughts. I've had lustful thoughts. I've had greedy thoughts. Because that is part of the whole, the whole theme of the Sermon on the Mount that we're reading right this week in 
that's the point of the liturgy this week, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is that it's not sufficient to have outward piety like the Pharisees, but you have to actually change the inner disposition of the soul. And, that, and it's, it's a very important point that thoughts have reality, because people often think of spiritual things or mental things in general as not having reality. But they're actually more real than material things. And this is, people think of the mind and the soul, angels, God, heaven, as being wispy and vapory and cloudy and just something vague and unreal, but it's actually the opposite. The material world, compared to the spiritual world, and even compared to the mental world, is relatively unreal. I mean, it's real, of course, but it's mental things, psychic things, and then especially spiritual things are realer, are more real. We ask in prayer to um, help us not to remember death. Not to remember bad thoughts, to get rid of bad memories. Bad memories and Yeah. It's one of the prayers of the Theotokos, cleanse me of all my evil memories. Right. Yeah. Before sleep. Before sleep. Now, that, that question of evil memories is very important because sometimes people will come to confession, <clears throat> they'll want to confess something that happened in the past they've already confessed. Mm -hmm. And they're torn because it's still bothering them, so they want to confess it. But they know that they were already forgiven, so they feel bad about confessing it again, as if they didn't trust in the power of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the confession of, of the sacrament of forgiveness. So if they say, oh, Father, this is still really bothering me, what I'll tell them is, um, the sin is truly forgiven. Have no doubt whatsoever that your sin is forgiven when the priest read the prayer of absolution for you. But if the thought is still bothering you, you may still confess the thought simply as a thought that's bothering you, mm -hmm. but not as a sin per se that you desire to commit. Mm -hmm. so the sin is forgiven, but simply it's something that's still tempting you or bothering you. And, uh, we'll, and, we'll, keep for, uh, and we'll keep praying till that thought goes away. Till that thought goes away. So it's three chords. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Once it's recorded, it's hard. Hard to get out. That's what we try to save our children. Keep from the children from the TV, movies. from the bad music, from the internet, and all that stuff, because those images are so powerful. Yeah, there, is, there is almost no way to do it. Hard to, only a miracle can scrub them out. Yeah. Especially at a young age. Yeah, and, and now they're increasing, they're increasing how bad they are by quantum leaps. It's just the, 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 the degeneration is, is very rapid now. And the power of the technology is, incre is increasing very, very greatly. So it's important to keep people pure. If people say, well, my children need bored. I say, let them be bored. It's a good experience. So give them something else. Yeah. Give them something else to do, yeah. Read, read, to, read, read to your children. Let them go out in the yard and make mud pies. You know, um, work, yes, <laughs> work. <laughs> Help mom clean the house. No, yeah. No, never no food for free. That's right. St. Paul said if they will not work, let them not eat. Was there something you wanted to say? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, Jim. I'm good. I'm no, good. please go ahead. I actually can't remember like what I was going to. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'm a little off short on attention. It'll come back. Sit, uh, lately. So. It'll come back. It'll come back. Yeah. So um. Uh, the the struggle. So the struggle of the thoughts is really, in a sense, the whole process of our salvation, as we work it out in our life is a struggle over our, the content of our, of our psychic life. Now, I, in my parish bulletin this month, I quoted the last testament of a bishop I knew, this Russian bishop named Anthony of Los Angeles, and he said we have to replace our ordinary psychological content with the prayer of Jesus. Now, if you think of all your thoughts, it'd be kind of scary actually to catalog all your thoughts in the course of the day. It'd be very humbling as well. And then it all, it would be. all that stuff that goes through your mind. And then if we actually replaced all of that with the prayer of Jesus, because that, that doesn't mean we wouldn't function. We, we'd function better. We could still make good decisions. We could still, our minds would still be focused on our work, on our profession, on family decisions, the things we need to do. That's no question of that. But if in every experimental moment we were calling upon the, the name of our Lord and asking his mercy and forgiveness, what a relief that would be from all the stuff that usually goes on. And, it, and it's important to get up early, to jump out of bed in the morning. You know, that's one of the worst moments is when you lie, you wake up in the morning, and you're not out, you haven't gotten out of bed, 
and all these dark thoughts start invading. Worries about your children, worries about work. Coffee. Worries about coffee. Worries about coffee. I wasn't. That's pretty mild, actually. That's not bad. Um, your coffee's coming right up. Uh, uh, is that a hint? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, it's so easy to talk about it. Yes, but, it's, but so what I'm saying is that it's, but what you find is you can have these dark thoughts where you're lying in bed in the morning, but then once you push yourself, jump out of bed, and you get dressed, and you, you wash your face, and you go and start saying your prayers, suddenly you realize that wasn't real. Or even if it's real, it's manageable. It wasn't this monster that, that I thought it was. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. I found helpful father and he went to monastery. Mm -hmm. Of course. At least a couple, three, four, four days at monastery mm -hmm. when you live in peace. Yes. And you will understand and appreciate peace. Yeah, in, in, a, in a well ordered monastery where there's real prayer going on, mm -hmm. and spiritual things become real. You realize, thank you, you realize there's a whole context for all this. And uh, our lives are so um, detached from the entire ethos in which uh, historically spiritual life took place. And when you when you go back and visit a historically Orthodox country, and you see the monasteries everywhere in Greece and Romania, you know, at one time in Russia until they were destroyed. Uh, but there are monasteries in Greece. There's a, you, you go every couple of blocks, you see some kind of a little monastery or a little church, and you realize that the this so-called hesychastic life, the life of prayer, was actually the foundation of the culture. It actually created the culture, because all the good, all the beautiful thoughts flowed from the prayer. Thoughts about art, thoughts about your work, thoughts about politics, thoughts about economics. All these thoughts were flowing from prayer and the atmosphere, and grew up in the atmosphere of prayer. Amen. So it was it was a profound. Uh, the atmosphere is permeated by it, and in the monasteries, that atmosphere is still present. You go in, and it's it's the, the, yes, the ordered environment where prayer is first, and where. Um, and You're free. In the Your mind is free. When I, when I visited monastery, even four o'clock in the morning when they called for a service, like at home you always have. Wow. But in monastery you don't even think about. Don't think about that. You just get up. You just get up and go. And go. Yeah. And now, if you actually try to stay in the monastery for a while, well, then there's a great struggle. Right. Yes, it is. For visitors, it's it's a wonderful experience, but then if someone then becomes committed and actually decides to become a monastic, then there is there is a great struggle. There's a very good struggle. And and uh, to overcome boredom, the boredom, the tedium of monastic life. But, but once you... To our life, sometimes maybe it's, it's good to visit monastery. To yes, wake up. we should. We need to, to wake up. To wake up. Yes. Actually, the monastic life is the truly natural life because it's a natural rhythm. Normal life. It's normal life, yeah. Except for the, the aspect of celibacy, which is, of course, is above nature. Um, but the overall rhythm of prayer work, uh, to a great extent, Christian in Christian societies, people experience this, lay people experience this. They, were, they had fe feast days, you know, um, uh, people are talking about how medieval peasants were oppressed and all this, but if you actually do studies, whether in the Western Europe or in the Byzantine Empire or in the uh, Slavic Middle Ages, if historians have done studies of how many days the peasants actually worked, and in many of these societies they had 150 days off a year, because all the Sundays and all the feast days and all the whole first week of Great Lent and all of Holy Week and the 12 days between Christmas and Epiphany, <laughs> they didn't work. They, they had to feed the animals and, you know, do the ordinary stuff, keep things going. When but it rained. When it rained, when it snowed. Rained, when it snowed. <laughs> so it was life at a, life at a humane, at a humane pace, and permeated by the feast days of the church, permeated by by prayer, 
So it's, it's not, um, not paradise, obviously. I mean, and we've gotten to the point now that every, every day is a feast day, so we wouldn't be working at all now. Well, we have to. <laughs> I think every locality would have more important ones. <laughs> I think the local landlord would say, uh, tell the priest, you know, don't serve every everyday father, because we have to get some work out of the tenants here. But, um, or the headman of the village, or whoever it was. But, uh, Isn't that our purpose of life, Father, to get ready and to prepare our soul and our heart for, and we'll go into our nature and we will live this life? Yeah, that were the thoughts, the thought, oh, that's why the whole purpose of the Jesus prayer and the whole process of this hesychastic form of prayer is that the, the, the thought of the prayer becomes the content of our psychological life. And in, in a way known alone to God, he elevates this to truly spiritual life, in communion with his Holy Spirit. And that is, uh, and uh, our soul desires to be with God all the time. Because when our, our first parents were created, to be in living communion with God at all times, to be talking to God all the time. And then through the fall, they lost this intimacy with God and their mind was broken into a thousand pieces and scattered like a broken mirror that then doesn't accurately reflect reality. And that's what makes us sick. And by putting the mind back through prayer, the mind starts more and more to reflect the reality of God. And, and uh, this, and the soul reacquires its original likeness to God. And we're ready to die. Or, or, and death really, as St. Paul says, for the Christian, death is no more. Death becomes truly a, a passage to life. Mm -hmm. From one. From, from one, yes, from one to the other. Yeah. So uh, it's it is preparation for death. Also, another way of looking at it is that heaven is an eternal uh, service, church service. Right. So people come and they say, "Well, I'm so bored. These Orthodox services are so long." I say, "Well, do you want to go to heaven?" He said, well, of course. So we better get used to it because it's one long church service. It's one long well, liturgy. Father, that's not fair. <laughs> Except you enjoy it. <laughs> and when the when the Protestant or somebody else they say uh, going about in heaven, and they don't they don't they don't go to church, then how do they know how to pray to praise God? Yeah. Well, that's why in um, the Apocalypse. St. John's first vision is of the Son of Man, who instructs him to write the seven letters to the seven churches. But his second vision is a vision of the heavenly liturgy, where heaven opens up, and he sees the eternal liturgy going on. The Ancient of Days and the Lamb and the 24 elders offering the bowls of incense. It's, it's, and he's showing the eternal, perpetual liturgy that's going on in heaven. And so in the Orthodox services, you have very much the sense, and it's even stated in the services, that our, this is our participation in something that's going on all the time. It's eternal. It's going on all the time. <coughs> and uh, that's why the, the, the big struggle for the church calendar, because in the services over and over again, it says, today Christ is baptized. Today the River Jordan is turned back. Today Christ is born. Today Christ has conquered death. It's this day, but it's it's. But it, we also today the, he, the angels in heaven rejoice with the church on earth. So it's the heavenly and, and earthly church are simultaneously celebrating this great mystery that's that's going on on that day. And uh, and then the day the day on earth becomes a portal or a doorway to the perpetual day. That will never end. So Sunday is the first day, but it's also the eighth day. It's the eighth day, that the day that has no end, after which there's no night. Yeah. So I see Pentecost is Pentecost is the eighth day after seven times seven days. Yeah. So the fiftieth day. So the fiftieth day is like a super eighth day because it's after seven times seven. So the mystery of the Holy Trinity is revealed on Pentecost. So that's why we don't fast this week. Because this week is an image of the eternal kingdom where there's no fasting. There's just the, perpetual, the eternal banquet in the, in the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, so, so 
we have to start this in the heart. This perpetual liturgy needs to go on in the heart, and that's the, the Jesus prayer is the tool. I mean, after confession and Holy Communion, the Jesus prayer is really the primary tool in Orthodox spiritual life to transform the heart, to, to get rid of sin and to acquire holiness. So let me read a little bit further. <clears throat> in the chapter on obedience, St. John of the Latter says, constantly struggle with your thought. And whenever it is gathered, carried hither and thither, collect it together. God does not require from novices prayer completely free from distractions. Do not despond when your thought is distracted, but remain calm and unceasingly restore your mind to itself. So we shouldn't be disturbed if our mind wanders. And there are different kinds of mental disturbance. One is just the mind wandering. I'm praying and I think about work. So you have at work, where I think about, I have to cut the grass tomorrow. Or what time is it? What time is it? Yeah, what time is it? Yeah. And uh, yeah, go and check, what, what time is it? And uh, why? What difference does it make? So, so we're, either we or our enemy, the devil, is doing this to take us away. And the mind doesn't need much demonic provocation. It's just, it's naturally unstable. It'll just do this. But sometimes people have really bad thoughts. Um, on the subject of bad thoughts, sometimes people are in despair or they're very upset with themselves because they have really bad thoughts and can't get rid of them. They have very, very dirty thoughts about terrible things, so they have even blasphemous thoughts. Blasphemous? Blasphemia? Um, uh, blasphemy in Russian. Oh my, I've forgotten. It's, uh, it's saying, saying grossly inappropriate things about God. Oh, okay. okay. The saints. The saints. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, pious, especially religious people, suddenly involuntarily have these terrible thoughts, and and they're disturbed. How could this happen? When that happens, it probably is something demonic. The enemy. It's the enemy, because your mind naturally wouldn't do that. Or very persistent, impure thoughts. Now, all of us have. Uh, most of us have passing impure thoughts or temptations. But when somebody has very persistent impure thoughts, usually it's the, the, uh, the invisible enemies of our salvation have grabbed onto something inside of us and they are, they're, they're aggravating it. And the best way to get rid of this is by confession, saying it out loud before the priest, and getting a prayer read, read over us, the prayer of forgiveness read over us. Because that, that just breaks it. Um, but we shouldn't be... Uh, depressed and we shouldn't be alarmed or, or um, upset if those things happen. They do happen. And we just have to, we just have to fight with the tools that are at hand. Okay. <clears throat> Here is taught a method of praying attentively, of praying both vocally and with the mind alone. In attentive prayer, the heart cannot help taking part, as St. Mark has said. The mind which prays without distraction constrains the heart. So you know the whole the whole effort of our prayer life is for the mind to unite with the heart. And as the mind grows in concentration, as the mind more and more focuses on the thought of Jesus, or as the mind when we're just reading the regular prayers, the mind focuses on the thought and the prayers, the heart starts being attracted to these things. We can't force our heart to love spiritual things. The heart naturally is attracted to spiritual things when the mind is focused on those things. So the heart is involuntarily attracted to what the mind is focused on. That's why it's very important to focus your mind on the right things. Because the heart will grow to love the things that the mind is focused on. What gives great power to these various addictions is that the heart falls in love with what the mind is filled with. So if a person is looking at certain kind of internet sites or certain kinds of listening to certain kinds of music, the heart follows the mind. It's like the mind is like the, the husband and the heart's the wife. And where the, the mind goes, the heart will follow. So the, the mind gives the direction, but the heart gives the power. And uh, so it, it can go in one direction or the other. So it's very important to focus the mind. If the mind if by the force of your will, just keep pushing your mind back 
to prayer and to the thought of good things, your heart will be healed. It will naturally, spontaneously follow where the mind is going. So the mind which prays without distraction constrains the heart. It tells the heart, no, stay here. Focus on this. Thus he who prays by this method proposed by John DeLatter, the one we just read, will pray with the lips and with the mind and with the heart. And when he becomes proficient in prayer, he will acquire mental prayer and the prayer of the heart, and he will attract divine grace to himself, as is evident from the words we have quoted of the great director of monks, St. John the Latter. What more can be desired? Nothing. What delusion can there be in this way of praying? Only thought wandering and distraction. But this is a fault that is completely obvious, inevitable in beginners, but capable of immediate treatment through the restoration of the thought to the words. Moreover, by the mercy and help of God, with constant effort, distraction is eventually eliminated. So he brings up the question of what delusion can there be here? Because people do, there are critics who say that unless you live in a monastery, you shouldn't say the Jesus prayer because you'll fall into plani and to delusion, prelis. But what Ignatius de Benchinuk is saying is that if you use this simple method and don't try to use very complicated methods and don't try to read the whole philokalia and imagine that you're attaining these spiritual levels and all this kind of thing. And there's no delusion here. There's no harm here. And it's very safe. And it's really safer because the, when, you, when you're forcing yourself to pay attention like this, your mind becomes purer and healthier and safer. So that it's actually very safe. I don't know, perhaps delusion is safe too. I mean, uh, if, uh, Only temporarily. My, my children, when they were young, they, they said, you know, uh, I, I do do this because you're, this is what you're supposed to do. Well, but I can't. Well, you know, pretend that you can. You know, pretend you're, you're a good uh, child and uh, you will be. <laughs> okay, well, there is the no, delusional. Well, that's the delusional a, aspect. Yeah, that's something. not really. <laughs> That's not spiritual delusion, of no, course. That's not spiritual delusion. That is that is a healthy use of the imagination. <laughs> I would call that I would call that a healthy or desirable use of the imagination. Like your ice skater, before you do the triple jump, you, you have visualize, to visualize, it. sure, you pretend to do it. Of course, that's the that's a correct or healthy use of the imagination. Um, the imagination is a faculty of the mind that was created by God. We use the imagination, and iconographer uses the imagination to image. He's not making it up from scratch. He's making a copy of something, but he still has to form the image in his mind before he does it. Um, a preacher, when he gets up and tells a story about a saint, he's using his imagination to picture this and then to creatively say it in the most engaging words. So there are, of course, there are proper uses of the imagination. And, and the warnings of the fathers against the use of the imagination don't mean that the imagination is inherently evil. It's Just that you're, you pretend or you think that you are holier than what, what you that's are. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's you, a problem. You think you're, obviously, you're more uh, and spiritual he, than what you are. And when people start believing they're spiritual, then the devil can see this and start actually giving them visions and... Humility. Humility is the key. Uh, and humility is the most difficult thing to attain because it means seeing yourself as you really are. Which is, that's, you might say that's the whole key to life or the whole... The whole effort of our life is to see ourselves as we really That's are. That's why priests should marry. Their wives keep them grounded. They keep yeah. them humble. <laughs> they keep telling them. That's that a very go good wrong. method. God, God was very wise when he gave man wet marriage. Because, uh, what, what do you mean I uh, see yourself as you really are? To, to see... Um, With all your faults. So that and faults and, 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 your good, and your good side, too. Good side. Yeah, because whether we're puffing ourselves up or whether we're always running ourselves down, those are both forms of pride because it's kind of an obsession with the ego. In the ego, what's the ego? The ego is our fallen self, the self that we've, we've created out of our mistaken ideas about ourselves. Either our par parents can give, have given us mistaken ideas, even good parents, you know, about ourselves, neighbors, teachers, then ourselves, and then, of course, devils, too. And, uh, television. Uh, at Madison Avenue, the marketing industry gives us false ideas about ourselves. Buy this car and you will be... You'll be attractive. Yes. You'll, you'll win the 
you know. So ego is bad at all times. Ego, the uh, the ego, is the the fallen self, or it's 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 our it's our damaged sinful self. So therefore, ego is not good. It is. It's. It needs salvation. It needs redemption and salvation. Um, so the ego could be that. Well, the ego becomes transformed into the true self. Uh, in the book of, of Revelation, you know, I mentioned those seven letters to the seven churches, and then, and um, at the end of each revelation, Christ says to to him who conquers, I will give, and he'll give a different reward. In one of them, he says, I will give a white stone on which is written a name, your real name, known only to God. Like God knows who our real self is. A big mistake we make is that we think our real self is someone in the past or some bad thing we're uncovering now. <coughs> it's a big mistake to see something bad about ourselves and say, aha, that's my real me. And that's, the, that's not the real me. That is... A, a parasite or a deformation of my real self. My real self is a self I'm becoming. St. Paul says, forget what's behind and you know, press ahead to what's ahead. And our real self is the self God sees that he wants us to be. That God created each of us uniquely. In all eternity, God visualized each of us. And each of us, we all have something in common, our human nature. We all have that in common. We all have the same human nature. But then each of us has a specific and unique identity. Our, the Greek fathers called the hypostasis, which we can just conveniently call personhood, or our own unique personhood, that God visualizes and he loves from all eternity. And that he has a plan for this unique person to become its true self to be sanctified. That's what we mean by sanctification, holiness. Uh, the technical term in Greek is thalesis, uh, divinization, acquiring the divine energies. And so we should never say, aha, I've recovered my real self. Now, if we uncover a sin or we remember a, a bad thing we did in the past we never thought about, it, we should admit it. Say, oh, I, I acknowledge it, I own it, I'm deeply repentant for it. But it shouldn't cause us to despair because we say, well, that's not my real self. That is something I really did or that I really thought or a way I really acted. But it doesn't define my identity. It's not my true self. It's just something that is part of me but that I'm leaving behind. Not that I, and now actually that I've acknowledged it and confessed it and renounced it and am asking God's help to get rid of it, I really know I can leave it behind. So, um, I step, step, step by. Yep. Um, so the, the important thing is uh, to realize that God, um, God alone knows our true self and that he alone uh, can restore us to, to our true self. Okay. Um, yes, he's all merciful. Yes. yes. Yes, all merciful. So Omega Elios, the great mercy. Yeah, Elios. Elios, Milosevdia. Mm -hmm. In Greek is Elios. Not to be confused with Eleon, which is oil. But the fathers will make a play on words and they'll say the oil of God's mercy. To Elion, to Eleos. The oil of the oil of his mercy. Recalling the oil that the the, the good Samaritan poured on the right on the, uh, the, the, the wounded man, to heal the wounded man. Okay. Well, we've been going for about an hour now. Are there any observations or questions? <laughs>